Hello everyone. I will be discussing human computer interaction. And this is the 14th chapter of the book Systems Analysis and Design by Kendall and Kendall. So for our learning objectives at the end of this chapter, you will be able to understand human computer interaction. You will be able to design useful touchscreen interfaces for smartphones and tablets. You'll be able to design a variety of user interfaces and effective on-screen dialogue for human-computer interaction. Continuing, you will understand the importance of user feedback. You will be able to articulate human-computer interaction implications for designing e-commerce websites. And finally, you will be able to formulate queries that permit users to search the web. Alright, so in terms of human-computer interaction, it is important that a systems analyst and as well as the other developers of the system is aware of human-computer interactions concept. While awareness is important, it is also important to recognize that we need to master the concepts surrounding human-computer interaction concepts. Of course, we need to become proficient in assessing human information requirements and incorporating our findings into our design. So there are, nowadays, there are um, specific guidelines that can be used for usability and these guidelines mandate making websites and electronic services accessible to the able-bodied and disabled alike. And so, the developers and the, the analysts should be able to gather information about how human-computer interaction is important in designing a system. So our major topics will cover the following. So we'll try to understand human-computer interaction, designing for cognitive styles of individual users, physical considerations in human-computer interaction design, user interfaces, dialogue design, feedback, and queries. Let's begin our discussion by understanding human-computer interaction. So when we try to dig deeper into human-computer interaction, we're talking about designing a system on how we can incorporate human-computer interaction. And that means when we, tr when we try to design a system with HCI concerns, it means we are trying to ensure that the system's functionality and, and usability can provide effective user interaction support and enhance the pleasant user experience. So the goal of human-computer interaction is to achieve both organizational and individual user effectiveness and efficiency. And to be able to attain these goals, the managers and the developers need to be knowledgeable about the interplay among the different users, right? Not only the users, but they would also um, have the knowledge about the different tasks and the task context, the information technology, and the environment in which the systems are used. And these components comprises or comprise the basis of human computer interaction. So let's try to begin our exploration of human computer interaction with some useful definitions that are commonly shared among those working in the field. The first one is the task. So a good fit between the user, uh, the human-computer interaction elements of the human, 
the computer and the task that needs to be performed leads to the performance and well-being. So, what about this task? So, this task is very important and as we all know, these are the complex tasks that require human system and task interaction that are commonly supported by different systems such as e-commerce, web systems, ERP systems, and wireless systems which are inside and outside of the organization. And the structure of the task can be structured and routine or ill-defined and without apparent structure. The definition of the word performance in human-computer interaction context is also a key and in this case the term performance refers to a combination of the efficiency involved in performing a task and the quality of the work that is produced by the task. For example, if an analyst are, uh, is using high-level software or a case tool to create data flow diagrams in which he or she is proficient, so we would predict that the quality of the data flow diagrams produced would be high. So the performance is also efficient because the analyst is using an automated tool with which he or she is familiar. So she or he can work rapidly with good results. So the task fits the objective which is to create high quality data flow diagrams to document a system. So the efficiency of producing such diagrams with a case tool which can be used to store retrieve, communicate, and modify the unified modeling language diagrams, these are all excellent compared to the alternatives such as using a drawing tool that is unrelated to a data dictionary or drafting diagrams by hand, neither of which offer such features. So the next one would be the well-being. So at this point, we can introduce the concept of well-being which is concerned for a human's overall comfort, safety, and health. So in summation, it is their physical as well as their uh, psychological uh, state. For example, we can ask, does using a case tool for producing UML diagrams or data flow diagrams on a computer serve the analyst's well-being? Yes, because the task fits well with the analyst, which is the software. So the objective and the comfortable uh, and the computer. No? So notice that the analysts are working in an environment when they, where they are physically um, will become comfortable with the system that they are working with and it makes them psych psychologically motivated to be creative and they become productive also each analyst is valued by peers and clients as well as valued monetarily by the employing organization so psychological attitudes which is the affective component are also important so how users feel about themselves their identities their work life and performance can all be gauged through assessing their attitudes next is usability so usability is a term that is defined differently depending on which branch of science you are investigating. So for our purposes in exploring usability through a human-computer interaction lens, we'll try to focus 
on usability as a way for designers to evaluate the systems and interfaces they create with an eye toward addressing as many human computer interaction concerns as thoroughly as possible. So usability studies according to some sources are all about finding out what works in the world and what doesn't. The international standard organization for example has created usability standards that you can explore for example you can explore it from www.usabilitynet.org and these standards cover the use of the product such as the effectiveness the efficiency and satisfaction in a particular context of use also it covers the user interface and interaction it also covers the process used to develop the product and the capability of an organization to apply user-centered design so basically um, these are all important when it comes to usability a research from known um, computer scientists such as Nielsen and Mack in 1994 and again in 2001 Nielsen, Mollich, Schneider and Farrell they published usability heuristics or rules of thumbs based on thousands of usability uh, tests of interfaces and later they test it through e-commerce websites and they include visibility of system status and much between the system and the real world and then they also included user control and freedom consistency and standards error prevention reconnection rather than recall flexibility and efficiency of use aesthetic and minimalist design which will help the users uh, how to recognize and also they included diagnosis and recovery from errors and help and documentation some of these are, are, are uh, already familiar to you from the input and output design chapters alright now one important consideration is that data particularly data used for decision making are made available in different forms this is to ensure that the users with different cognitive abilities can make sense of them some users they may prefer to examine tables and make decisions some of them they prefer graphs some or others they may want to read it as a narrative text so it's also imaginable that the same person wants different types of presentations at different times for example suppose a manager wants to compare inventory held at different stores in a region a graph can present the data very effectively a column chart can use colors to show when a store is near its stock out level and it can also show the relative amount of stock by allowing the user to visually compare the height of the bars directly right so in terms of designing for cognitive styles each individual may choose to use different ways on how they uh, perceive different things okay for example um, the different person that I'm talking to may have or may want to see the same data but he may want to see it in different ways for example no? like for example using pivot tables so pivot tables uh, allows the user to arrange the data in a table in any way they choose okay 
So the user, for example, has a greater control over how they look at data in different ways within the table. No? This is an example of a pivot table and they considered it as a template which uh, which is uh, wherein we can make it easier for users to see information displayed in different ways so the the user can pick from this list so this is the pivot table field list wherein the user can drag and drop the different items here and then they can display the information that they want to display so the user or that this table allows the user to arrange the data especially in this table in any way they choose okay so in this case they can choose for example the product drag it over to the table template and drop it on one of the blank areas okay so the user for example can drag the 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 sales or or they can choose the quarter no and drops it into the area called drop column fields here right so they can they can know uh, they can view this table in different ways so this is what we call an example of a pivot table where the users can view the information in a table in any way they choose. For quite some time, innovative visual displays of data have existed and barriers to widespread use of visual displays included lack of imagination and the inability to draw graphs and charts in a cost-effective manners and lack of appreciation for such dis display now the consumer of information must be able to interpret the information in the diagram or it adds little value software that enables the user to visually examine a database or spreadsheet now are available so one example is the tableau software product which is available in www.tableausoftware.com which uses an approach similar to the pivot table approach that we have seen in the Microsoft Excel so the tableau allows the user to drag and drop variables onto either a row or a column and then they appear on a graph so this is an example of the tableau that we are telling although nowadays it may look differently and it may look um, amazing because this one is an old image of the tableau software which is um, taken from the book okay so when different graphs or tables are displayed on the same page it resembles like a typical dashboard so the user can use in this example the users can definitely choose to designate different columns and different rows for example in this case a region and weekday were designated as columns and the sum or the sales total was designated as the row right so it depicted in the following we will see an example of how tableau displays the information to the user according to the preference of the user in the previous chapters we have learned the basis for sound design of screens forms websites and databases and this included the special use of fonts color and layout design to communicate to users 
and to help them to do the right thing with the input and output they encountered. So, to examine the underlying reasons for much of the design that we learned, it's useful to look at human sensory capabilities and limitations that will inform our design. And in keeping with the human-computer interaction philosophy, an analyst should be able to compensate, overcome, or replace human senses to a varying extent. For example, in terms of vision, if you become a system analyst, you should be accustomed to designing screens and reports for sighted people. So you have to use color, fonts, graphics, software, and PowerPoint presentations for displays, and printed reports as input and output, which were detailed in our previous chapters. All right. However, from a human-computer interaction perspective, you will also want to think in terms of the limitations on human vision. All right? Factors such as length of the distance from display to the person performing a task, the angle of the display in relation to the person viewing it. Next, we have the size and uniformity of the characters, the brightness, the contrast, the balance and the glare of the screen, and whether a display is blinking or stable, th these are all uh, could be designed to standards so that it will establish true international standards and other national and international groups. So those are in terms of vision. What about hearing? Humans also have limits to the amount of stress their senses can withstand. For example, noisy laser printers, phone conversations, shredders, they can lead to overload on human earring. So office workers can wear noise-canceling headphones or get a personal music player like an iPad. No? But these solutions may have the effect of isolating the person from the organizational setting and may even diminish their capability to perform the task at hand. So as an analyst, you will need to consider noise when you design office systems. In terms of touch, when using a human-computer interaction perspective to evaluate the usefulness of keyboards and other input devices, we can rate the human-computer fit as well as the dimension examining the human-computer task fit. So keyboards have been ergonomically designed to provide the correct feedback for the person doing data entry. And users know by the firmness of the key under their finger that the keystroke has been entered. So although keyboards can be silenced, they are often designed with a click of feedback that is emitted when a key is hit. So keyboards also include slightly raised bumps on what are called home keys. So often the F and the J keys also and this orients users to where their fingers are positioned on the keyboard. So enabling them to look at the screen or type from a printed page on their desk without continually glancing at the keyboard. So although the popular QWERTY keyboard that we have, um, we often use with computers today was originally designed to slow down typists so that mechanical keys of the day would not become entangled. And this layout has proved to be quite an efficient way to enter the data. In fact, since users do so, uh, um, since users do well with this familiar interface, it's difficult to conduct experiments comparing the efficiency of QWERTY keyboards with other innovative keyboards. So designing for data entry using numeric keypads as the human entry device also provides a decision point for designers. So we can notice that the numbers on your mobile phone are ordered differently 
than the numbers on a numeric keypad or calculator. So your phone may be arranged with the numbers 1, 2, 3 on the top row. And when you look at a calculator layout or a numeric keypad on your keyboard, you will see 7, 8, 9 on the top row instead. So research now points to the superiority of the calculator layout when the user is doing a lot of de uh, data entry. However, the phone digit layout is supposed to be better for locating number. So as a designer, you are constantly examining the fit between the human, the computer, and the tasks set by the organization. So basically, all humans have limitations in their physical capabilities. Some are immediately visible, others are not. So when designing from a computer-human or human-computer interaction perspective, you start realizing that limitations are often discussed in terms of disabilities. So the application of human-computer interaction to supporting and enhancing the physical capabilities of humans is one of the most promising application areas. Strides in biomedical engineering will mean that there is research to support the blind or those with low vision and those who are deaf or who have impaired hearing and people with limited mobility. So there are also improvements in the technical supports available to those who face difficulties in cognitive processing. And that includes persons suffering with symptoms of autism, dyslexia, and attention deficit disorder. So as a system analyst, you will be subject to the legal provisions of the country in which you are working. For instance, if you are designing for workplaces in the United States, you may want to access the obligations of the employer under the Americans with Disabilities Act. Okay, there is a website for that. Then you will find the definitions of who is considered disabled, which states in part. For example, here's an example of that. An individual with a disability is a person who is considered disabled which states that person has a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits one or more major life activities also considered disabled are the people who has a record of such impairment and lastly who is regarded as having such an impairment so here's a list of guidelines for the human computer interaction approach to systems design number one examine the task to be done and consider the fit among the human computer and the task number two identify what obstacles exist for users in their attempts to accomplish their assigned tasks. Number three, keep in mind perceived usefulness and perceived ease of use of technology. Fourth, consider usability. So you can examine the usage environment by creating use case scenarios that depict what is going on between users and the technology. And finally, you can use the information you have gained beforehand to figure out the physical and organizational environmental characteristics. So design with prototyping to accommodate diverse users and users with disabilities. So typically, our goal must be to design interfaces that help users and businesses get the information they need in and out of the system. And they can be done through the following objectives. Number one, to match the user interface to the task. Number two, to make the user interface efficient. Number three, provide appropriate feedback to users. Number four, generate usable queries. And lastly, 
improve productivity of computer users. In this section, several different kinds of user interfaces are described and this includes natural language interfaces, question and answer interfaces, menus, form field interfaces, command language interfaces, graphical user interfaces, and a variety of web interfaces for use on the internet. The user interface has two main components and this is these are the presentation language which is the count the computer to human part of the transaction and action language and which also characterize the human to computer portion so together both concepts cover the form and content of the term user interface so let's try to discuss one by one for example, the natural language interfaces. So natural language interfaces are perhaps the dream and ideal of inexperienced users because they permit them to interact with the computer in their everyday or natural language. There is no special key, uh, skills needed or required So basically, um, this is what the natural language interfaces are all about. In question and answer interface, the computer displays a question to the user on the display. And to interact, the user enters an answer. So it can be via a keyboard stroke or a mouse click and the computer acts uh, on that input information in a pre-programmed manner typically by moving to the next question all right or to a particular output on the display common example of a question and answer interface are the wizards we use to install our software and they are very common so the user responds to questions about the installation process such as where do you want to install the software or features so the wizard can also ask questions and respond to the user's answers with more questions designed to narrow the scope of the problem and this is a typical way of setting up a technical support interface in order to we know down problems and do more accurate troubleshooting. The next one are the menus. No? A menu interface borrows its name from the list of dishes that can be selected in a restaurant. So similarly, a menu interface provides the user with an on-screen list of available selections. So in responding to the menu, a user is limited to the options displayed. So the user need not to know the system but does not need to know what task should be accomplished. So for example, with a typical word processing menu, the users can choose from the edit, copy, or print options. And to utilize the menu best, users must know which task they desire to perform so menus are not hardware dependent and variations are many menus can be set up to use keyboard entry or light pen or touch screen or mouse and selections can be identified with a number a letter or keyword or users can click on a selection with mouse Alright, so consistency is important in designing a menu interface. So menus can be nested within one another to lead a user through options in a particular program. So they can be nested, so they are called nested menus, which allow the screen to appear less cluttered, which is consistent with good design. So they also allow the users to avoid seeing menu 
options in which they have no interest. And nested menus can also move users quickly through the program. So, in particular, we have what we call graphical user interface menus. And they are used to control personal computer software and have the following guidelines. Alright, number one, the main menu bar is always displayed. So, in every um, particular graphical user interface menu, we can see that the menu bar is always displayed. Number two, the main menu uses single words for menu items. And main menu options always display secondary drop-down menus. Number three, um, the main menu should have secondary options grouped into similar sets of features. Four, the drop-down menus that display when a main menu item is clicked often consists of more than one word. Alright, and secondary options perform actions or display additional menu items. And lastly, menu items in gray are unavailable or disabled for the current ID activity. Now, the object menu, also called a pop-up menu, is displayed when the user clicks on a graphical user interface object, especially when using with the right mouse button. And these menus contain specific uh, for the current activity and they are most likely are duplicate functions of main menu items. However, some experienced users may be irritated by nested menus. So they may prefer to use a single line command entry to speed things up. Uh, and the other users might use shortcut abbreviations or key combinations such as using the alt um, alt uh, alt command in our computer. So basically, uh, this is used sometimes for inserting pictures like for example, inserting a picture that is a clip art in a Microsoft Office do document. What about form field interfaces or we call it input-output forms? So the form field interfaces consist of on-screen forms or web-based forms displaying fields containing data items or parameters that need to be communicated to the user. So the form often is a facsimile of a paper form already familiar to the user. And this interface technique is also known as form-based method or input and output forms. Alright? The advantage of using this technique is that the field in form provides excellent documentation. And the disadvantage is that the user's experience with the system or application may become impatient. So, very common nowadays are the design of interfaces for smartphones and tablets. And um, we understood that the sensitivity of the screens is used using touch um, sensitive screens and allows a user to use his or her finger to activate the display. And these small devices, they can also use multi-touch gestures, which we can call the capacitive sensing. And they are used nowadays for moving from one screen to another or from one state to another on the same screen. Right? So there are um, three common gestures that can be used to interface with touch-sensitive smartphones and tablets. They are tapping, swiping, and pinching. So, if you are a mobile phone user, you can be familiar, you will be familiar with the different um, things such as receiving alerts, notices, and queries. No? And alerts 
notices and queries are forms of output on our smartphones and tablets. Basically, alerts are for critical information that the user needs to know in a timely manner, while the notifications are the non-critical information that is sent to the user. For example, a message um, was received, a missed call was received, for example, and some queries, uh, they are also used to ask questions of the user. So those are examples of alerts, notices, and queries. Also, we have what we call badges. What are badges? Badges are a little red circles and they are usually found in an app store. So a badge for the app store signifies how many updates are waiting for the user to download and install. So we have these badges. No? Badges are good because they are an uh, unobtrusive way to send a message to the user. However, it, uh, it, 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 it displays something that we need to download and install something from the application store. Okay? So they are also considered as a quiet and passive um, notification. In 2012, the Apple introduced Siri, which is built as your personal assistant, that helps us to get things done just by asking. So a user can speak to Siri in natural language, just as he or she would talk to a friend. And unlike older voice recognition systems, Siri doesn't need to be taught to respond to your voice commands. So dialogue is the communication between the computer and a person. And well-designed dialogue makes it easier for people to use a computer and lessens their frustration with the computer system. So we can recall the elements of the technology acceptance model or the TAM indicating that perceived usefulness and perceived ease of use will lead first to an intention to use the system and eventually to using it. And there are several key points for designing good dialogue and they include the following. First is the meaningful communication. Meaningful communication is needed so that the computer understands what people are entering and people understand what the computer is presenting or requesting. Also, um, another key point for designing good dialogue is to, is to have a minimal user action. Okay? And lastly, the standard operation and the consistency. In meaningful communication, the system should present information clearly to the user. So this means having an appropriate title for each display, for example, minimizing the use of abbreviations, and providing clear user feedback. So inquiry programs should display codes or meanings as well as data in an edited format, such as displaying slashes between the month, the day and the year in a date field or commas, and decimal points in the amount field. So users, uh, user instructions should be supplied regarding details such as available function key assignments and in a graphical user interface the cursor may change shape depending on the work being performed. So users with less skill with the computer require more communication. So th this means um, people with less skill in using the computer or doing their tasks with the computer, they require more communication. For example, the websites must be displayed or must display more text and instructions to guide the user through the site. Internet sites may have less dialogue because there is a measure of control over how well trained the users are because it's inside the organization. Internet graphics 
should have a pop-up text or rollover descriptions when images are used as hyperlinks because there may be uncertainty in interpreting their meaning especially if the site is used internationally and lastly in terms of meaningful communication there should be an easy to use help screens and it should be provided no many computers help screens have additional topics that may be directly selected using highlighted text displayed on the first help screen and these hyperlinks are usually um, in different color which makes them stand out in contrast to the rest of the help text the next one is to have a minimal user action so this means that keying is often the slowest part of computer system and good dialogue will minimize the number of keystrokes required so you can accomplish this goal in a number of different ways for example you can key codes instead of whole words so for example um, airport codes when making a flight reservations you can use airport codes instead of whole words on an entry screens so codes are also keyed when 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 we are using a command language interface such as a two-letter state postal abbreviation and in a graphical user user screen the codes may be entered by selecting descriptions of the codes from a pull-down list of available options and this helps to ensure accuracy next is to supply or enter the data that are not already stored on files for example if you change or delete an item record only the item number should be entered so the computer responds by displaying descriptive information that is currently stored on the item file another example is when user logs on to a website so the user ID is used to find related records such as customer record outstanding bills orders and so on the next one is to supply the editing characters for example slashes for date field or uh, separators so users should not have to enter formatting characters such as leading zeros commas or decimal point so when they enter a dollar amount they should not enter the decimal point so they have to they don't need to enter the slashes or hyphens when entering a date so in general websites are an exception to this rule because web forms do not include slashes or decimal points some web forms use a series of entry fields with editing characters between them such as parentheses around an area code next is to use default values for fields on entry screens so defaults are used when a user enters the same value in a screen field for the majority of the records being processed so the value is displayed and the user may press the enter key to accept the default or overtype the default value with a new one so the graphical user interfaces may contain check boxes and uh, radio buttons that are selected when a web form or dialog box opens and context sensitive menus appear when an object is clicked with the right mouse button and these menus can contain options specific to the object under the mouse next is to design an inquiry change or delete program so that the user needs to enter only the first few characters of a name or item description so the program displays uh, a list of all matching names and when the user chooses one the matching record is displayed next one is to provide 
keystrokes for selecting pull-down menu options. So, these options are selected using a mouse followed by keying and users must move their hands from the keyboard to the mouse and back. So, as users become familiar with the system, shortcut keystrokes provide a faster method for manipulating the pull-down menus because both hands remain on the keyboard and this helps users become efficient at their tasks on a personal computer or Mac computer keystrokes usually involve pressing a function key or the alt key followed by a letter as we have been doing in our daily task in our computer system the next is to use radio buttons and drop-down lists to control displays of new web pages or to change web forms. For example, um, when a radio button is clicked, a drop-down list may change to reflect the radio button choice. A radio button may be clicked and a form may change according to the choice. A drop-down list may change or a radio button may be clicked to move to a new web, uh, web page. Or a drop-down list are often provided on a web page for quick navigation. So the, the user can select a new web, web page from the drop-down list which will take the viewer to that page. Next is to provide cursor control for web forms and other displays so that the the cursor moves to the next field when the right number of characters has been entered. An example of this would be when a user enters an area code for uh, a telephone number and following the entry of three characters, for example, the cursor then moves to the local phone number field. So entering the software registration key codes is another example. So the codes are often in groups of four or five letters and when the first field is filled, the cursor moves to the next field and so on. So the analyst should examine every field to see whether automatic cursor control should happen. So any combination of these eight approaches can help the analyst decrease the number of keystrokes required by the user. So it will be speeding up the data, the data entry and minimize the errors. Now let's discuss about standard operation and consistency. So basically the system should be consistent throughout its set of different displays and in the mechanisms for controlling the operations of the displays throughout different applications. Consistency makes it easier for users to learn how to use portions of the system once they are familiar with one component. And we can achieve consistency by the following guidelines. Number one, we can locate titles, date, time, and operator, and feedback messages in the same places on all displays. Number two, exiting each program by the same key or menu option. Number three, canceling a transaction in a consistent way such as using the escape key. Okay. Number four, obtaining help in a standardized way such as using a function key. Number five, standardizing the colors used for all displays or web pages. Next, Standardizing the use of icons for similar operations when using a graphical user interface. Next, using consistent terminology in a display screen or website. Next, providing a consistent way to navigate through the dialogue. And finally, using consistent font alignment, size, and color on a web page. So basically, these are all guidelines 
on how we can achieve consistency when we are trying to design our system or our web design. What about feedback for users? So basically, all systems require feedback so that they can monitor and change the behavior of the system. So feedback usually compares your current behavior with a predetermined goals and gives back information describing the gap between actual and intended performance. And because humans themselves are complex systems, they require feedback from others to meet psychological and cognitive processing needs which we have discussed already in our chapter. So feedback also increases human confidence. Okay, and how much feedback is required is an individual characteristic. The following are types of feedback. For example, acknowledging acceptance of input. So the first situation in which users need feedback is to learn that the computer ha has accepted the input. For example, when user enters a name on a line, the computer provides feedback to the user by advancing the cursor one character at a time when the letters are entered correctly. So a web example would be a web page displaying a message that the letters are uh, or the payment has been processed and your confirmation number is uh, one two three four five six seven and so on no so thank you for using our services so that would be an example so definitely a type of feedback is something that acknowledge acknowledges the acceptance of everything that we input in our computer second Second type of feedback is to recognize that input is in the correct form. Okay? So remember when we design, the users need feedback to tell them that the input is in the correct form. For example, a user inputs a command and the feedback states ready as the program progresses to a new point. A poor example of feedback that tells the user that input is in the correct form is the message input OK because that message takes extra space and is very cryptic and does nothing to encourage the input of more data so when placing an order on the web or making a payment a confirmation page often displays requesting that the user review the information and click a button or image to confirm the order of payment. Another type of feedback is something that notifies that the user inputs something that is not in the correct form. So this is very crucial and this feedback is very necessary to warn the users that the input is not in the correct form. So when data are incorrect, one way to inform the user is to generate a window that briefly describes the problem with the input and explains how the user can correct it. So basically we encounter this a lot when we input something that is not correct in the form. So what we can notice is that the 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 message that we receive is something very polite and very concise and not cryptic so that even the inexperienced users will be able to understand it right the next type of feedback is to explain a delay in processing so one of the most important kinds of feedback informs the user that there will be a delay in processing his or her request. So delays longer than 10 seconds or so requires feedback so that the user knows the system is still working. So a typical um, 
a typical feedback like this display um, sometimes it shows a sentence reassuring the user that the request is being processed typically something like that as well as a sign in the upper right corner indicating the user to wait for example until the current command has been executed or the display will also provide a way to stop the operation if necessary so there is an option for the user to stop uh, the program or wait for further waiting however for some delays for example in some um, installation of new software a short tutorial on the new application is run while waiting no? so this is meant to serve as a distraction rather than feedback about the installation All right? another type of feedback would be to acknowledge that a request is completed so users need to know when their request has been completed and new requests may be input so often a specific feedback message is displayed so for example when an action has been completed by a user such as employee record has been added customer record has been changed or item number 12345 has been deleted so something like that another type of feedback is to notify that a request was not completed so if there is a request that is completed notifying the user there should be a notification that a request was not completed so basically feedback is also needed for such cases no? to let the user know that the computer is unable to complete a request so if the display reads unable to process request check request again so the user can then go back and check to see if the request has been input uh, correctly rather than the continue to enter the commands that cannot be executed finally that last type of feedback is to offer the user more detailed feedback so users need to be reassured that more detailed feedback is available and they should be shown how they can get it commands such as assist instruct explain and more may be employed or the user may type a question mark or click on an appropriate icon to get more feedback and using the command help as a way to obtain further information has been questioned because users may feel helpless or caught in a trap from which they must escape and this convention is in use and its familiarity to users may overcome this concern so when designing web interfaces hyperlinks can be embedded to allow the user to jump to the relevant help screens or to view more information hyperlinks are typically highlighted with underlining italics or a different color and sometimes hyperlinks can be graphics it can be text or sometimes they are icons if used correctly feedback can be a powerful reinforcer of users learning processes uh, it can also serve to improve user performance with the system and it can increase the motivation to produce and improve the feed among the user task and the technology so basically there are a variety of help options that we can use and these are called feedback on our personal computers that has been developed over the years we call it the F1 or the help which was originally started as a response to the user who pressed a function key such as the F1 key so the graphical user interface alternative is the pull down help menu and this approach was cumbersome because end users had to navigate through a table of contents of search via an index 
Also, we have what we call a context-sensitive help wherein the users could simply click on the right mouse and then the topics or explanations about the current screen or area of the screen would be revealed. A third type of help on the personal computer occurs when the user places the uh, the user places the arrow over an icon. No? This is called the icon mouse hover help. Okay, and it leaves it there for a couple of seconds. And at this point, some programs pop up uh, a balloon similar to those found in comic strips. And this balloon explains a little bit about the icon function. Another type of help is the wizard, no? which asks the user a series of questions and then takes action accordingly. So basically, wizards help users through complicated or unfamiliar processes such as setting up the network connection or booking an, an, an airline seat online. Okay? And most users are familiar with wizards through creating a PowerPoint presentation or choosing a style for a word processing memo. Besides building help into an application, software manufacturers offer online help or they call it um, helplines. So it's either automated or personalized with live chat. And sometimes they are, uh, they are using uh, customer service telephone lines which are either um, sometimes they are not toll free and some they use commercially off the shelf software to offer a fax back system okay finally users can seek and find support from other users through software forums and this type of support is of course they are unofficial and the information you obtain may be true it can be partially true or it can be misleading so the principles regarding the use of software forums are the same for those uh, mentioned which will be discussed later where folklore and recommendation systems are discussed so the approach uh, any software fixes posted on bulletin boards, blogs, discussion groups, or chat rooms with uh, wariness and skepticism. Those will be discussed later on. Alright? For e-commerce, many of the user interface design principles concerning feedback also extend to designing e-commerce websites. And a few extra considerations shown in this particular section can give us web interface designs improve functionality for example the first one is to solicit feedback from e-commerce website customers so not only do we need to give users feedback about what is happening with an order but we also need to get information or get feedback as well and most e-commerce websites have a feedback button there are two standard ways to design what users will experience when they click on the feedback button so the first way is to launch the users email program okay so with the email address of the company's contact automat automatically entered into the to field and this method prevents typing errors and facilitates ease in contacting the organization so the user doesn't need to leave the site to communicate with it and these messages however raise expectations that they will be answered just as regular mail or phone calls are so research indicates that 60 percent of organizations with this type of email contact feature on their sites they do not have anyone assigned to reply to the email messages received. So the, um, the appropriate thing to do is to, um, to just take the users to a blank message template 
wherein they can click on feedback. Okay? So the business is losing valuable feedback if there is no one to answer the feedback. Okay? So we should allow customers to to harbor the impression that they are communicating and if there are no responses received they might feel bad so if you design this type of feedback opportunity you need to design procedures for the organization to reply to email from the website and some designers handle this problem by creating systems to automatically return an email reply it's gen it generates a unique case of incident number and provides further instructions on how the clients or users can proceed for example there is a hyperlink to frequently asked questions or it can offer a phone number to helplines that are uh, unavailable to the general public so the last one is to take the users to to a blank message all right and it could be a template where then they can click on the feedback and some web create uh, creation tools permit you to create and insert a feedback form into your site easily and this form might begin with a header that states uh, for example company feedback and then you can use this form below to send suggestions comments and questions about the particular site and to this particular customer service team so fields should include the following such as first name last name email address and regarding or a subject field that supplies a drop-down menu of the company's product or service selection which asks the user to please make a selection or enter your message here all right so the standard submit and clear buttons are at the bottom of the form and using this type of form permits the analyst to have the user data already formatted correctly for storage in a database so consequently it makes the data entered into a feedback which is easier to analyze in the aggregate so the analyst does more than just design a response to individual email the analyst helps the organization to capture store process and analyze valuable customer information in a manner that makes it more likely that the company will be capable of spotting important trends in customer response rather than simply reacting to individual queries one of the things that the analyst should do is to design the e-commerce websites in such a way that it will be easy to navigate no? we call it one-click navigation so in some cases they need to create a rollover menu alright so they can build a collection of hierarchical links so that the home page can become an outline of the key topic headings associated with the website number three they can place a sitemap on the home page and emphasizing the link to it alright so this would also be placed on every other page on the site and lastly they can place a navigational bar on every inside page that repeats the categories used on the entry screen for other navigation options including a search function is another option and include adding a search engine such as Google to the site will be helpful okay and then simple search functions can also work well for small manageable sites but as the site grows large an advanced uh, search function that include boolean logic are needed so they can also create flexibility in the way the users navigate the web by 
How do they do that? By incorporating many different ways to look up information on a particular subject. Alright? So they can create for users with different cognitive processing or interests and that it will make the customers to be kept on the website easily. An application programming interface or API is a set of small programs and protocols used like building blocks for building software applications. And when two or more APIs are used together, they form a mashup. So many mashups are open source. So developers can use an API from a site like Google Maps and combine it with an API that contains other data. So it results in a new website that creates an entirely new application. So what about designing queries? So when users ask questions or they want to communicate with the database, they are said to query it. And six different types of queries are among the most common. So it helps uh, in designing the queries properly. It helps reduce users' time spent in querying the database. And it also helps them find the data they want which result in a smoother user experience overall. So the following are some of the types of queries. So the questions we pose um, concerning data from our database are referred to as queries. And there are six basic query types as I mentioned and each query involves three items. The first is the entity second is the attribute and the third one is the value and in each case two of these are given and the intent of the query is to find the remaining item and it will be used to illustrate in our examples that we will try to to give okay so the first query type or do we call it the query type one it says that the entity and one of the entity's attributes are given. So the purpose of the query is to find the value and the query can be expressed as follows. So what is the query? So for example, what is the value of a specified attribute for a particular entry? So sometimes it's more convenient to use a notation to formulate the query. Alright? However, we'll not discuss that this time. No? So the second type of query is the intent of the second type of query is to find an entity or entities when, when an attribute and value are given. So this is the second type of query that states what entity has a specified value for a particular attribute? The third type of query, which is the query type 3. So the purpose of this query type is to determine which attributes fit the description provided when the entity and value are given. Like in this case, the query type 3 can be stated as follows. So what attribute or attributes has or have a specified value for a particular entry? So the next type of query is the query type 4. So this is almost similar to query type 1. The difference is that the values of all attributes are desired. So query 4 can be expressed as follows. So list all the values for all the attributes for a particular um, entity. Query 5 is the fifth type of query but is another global query. Similar in form to query type 2 
but it can be stated as follow. So, list all entities that have a specified value for all attributes. Finally, we have the six query type, which is similar to query type number three. And the difference is that query type six requests a listing of the attributes for all entities rather than a particular entry. So it can be stated as follow, list all the attributes that have a specified value for all entities. Now, as described in the illustration, it's possible to perform these six basic types of queries on a table that contains entities, attributes, and values. Alright? So, basically, we can build more complex queries, and we can do other methods of querying. So, as we have discussed, these are some of the query notation of the different types of queries. For example, in query type 1, B points to elements such as E and A, where V is the value, and E is an entity, and A is an attribute variable in a parenthesis. And each parenthesis, or each content, each element in the parentheses are all the uh, elements that are given and the V here is the value that we are trying to query on the database. So in, in query type 1, if you remember, we are given two provisions such as the entity and the attribute and we are looking for the value. For query type 2, we are given the value and the attribute and we are looking for the entity. For query type 3, we are looking for the attribute given the value and the entity. For another type of query, these are the notation. If we are looking for all values, we need what we need is to have the entity and all attributes of those entities. If we are looking for all entities, which is the query type 5, we need all attributes of the values. And if we all need all the attributes, what we need is all entities for all the values. So what we have discussed are the types of query that only use for building blocks for more complex uh, queries and we can build more complex queries using those uh, six query types and this um, complex queries are considered to be um, expressions referred to as boolean expressions and they can be formed for queries as well. No? An example of a Boolean expression is, for example, you can list all the customers who have zip codes greater than or equal to a certain number. For example, if you are living in Antipolo, the zip code of Antipolo or a particular barangay in Antipolo, let's say Mayamot, you have 1870 as the zip code and if you want to list all the customers who have zip codes greater than that particular zip code so that would be a, an example of a boolean expression of how we can create a complex uh, query for our database okay so we can also use um, not only the greater than symbol or the equal symbol, we can only also use the less than symbol. Alright? And then we can also add more details such as, for example, certain conditions. For example, we can take uh, those who have ordered more than a particular price from a certain database or catalog 
and we can also gather information or query for information that have been ordered for the last five uh, at least five times in the past year okay however there is also a difficulty with um, building and constructing these particular complex queries no? for example the AND no? the AND belongs in which condition it's also difficult to determine the sequence in which the parts of the expression should be carried out alright so basically when we do build complex queries we usually perform first the exponentiation and then followed by either multiplication or division and then addition or subtraction so basically this is in the form of the what we call the PEMDAS operation wherein the the parenthesis is operated first and then the exponent and then the multiplication and division and finally the addition or subtraction meanwhile the comparative operations are performed afterwards no followed by the arithmetic operations so such um, comparative operations such as greater than less than and equal are uh, performed and finally the boolean operations are performed last no? so but in comparing between AND and OR boolean operator the first to be performed is the AND operation rather than the OR operation. Now there are two popular query methods that are query by example and structured query language. No? The query by example which is very popular or we call it the QBE is a simple but powerful method for implementing queries in database systems such as for example Microsoft Access. So the database fields are selected and displayed in a grid and the requested query values are either entered in the field area or below the field. So the query should be able to select both the rows from the table that match conditions as well as specific column fields. All right? So that's uh, an example of a query method. The next one is what we call the structured query language or the SQL. Some pronounce it as SQL, but preferably we can call it SQL. No? In our database classes, we call it SQL rather than SQL. Okay? So in this, uh, another popular way to implement query, it uses a series of words and commands to select the rows and col columns that should be displayed in the resulting table. In our example for a, a, a query by example, this is a, an example of a query by example and in this example you will see that that the query design screen is divided in two portions and the top portion contains the tables selected for the query and their relationship and the bottom portion contains the query selection fields from the database tables that are dragged to the grid so the first two rows contain the field and the table in which the field is located and the next row contains sorting information and in this example the resource will be sorted by customer name in an ascending order and then there's a check mark a check mark in the show box indicates that the field is to be displayed in the output okay in the result okay so here you can notice that the customer number the customer name 
and status code meaning are selected for the resulting display okay and you can also notice that the account status code this one and the account type account type code are not checked and therefore it will not be displayed in the final results so in the criteria criteria rows there is a uh, there is a one in the account status code so you will see that so it indicates an active record and the C and the D here selecting a general customer or a discount customer so you can see that in the account type code columns where two conditions in the same row indicate an AND condition and two different conditions in different rows represents an OR condition and this query specifies that the user should select both an active customer and either a general or discount customer so finally we have what we call the structured query language for the customer name parameter query and in this figure it contains an uh, SQL code no? the select distinct row wherein the keyword determines which row are to be selected so from this row okay and then the where keyword specifies the condition okay that the customer name this customer name should be used to select the data entered in the like parameter so basically this standard a structured query language will have to query from this table no, from this customer and it will select from this particular um, columns okay from this table or right from this table where where indicates a condition and like probably it's like a parameter to select the data entered into this particular parameter all right so in summary we discuss in this topic in this chapter the human computer interaction the variety of interfaces designing the user interface and designing user feedback and designing e-commerce website feedback and navigation and we focus on understanding the human computer interactions to ensure the functionality and usability of computer systems that we design so when analysts create a proper fit among the human computer interaction elements of the human the computer and the task it will lead us to improve the performance and overall psychological and physical well-being of the individual so the design focused on developing a proper fit so that the analyst can use the technology acceptance model or the TAM to organize their thinking about whether users will accept technology and eventually use it by examining perceived usefulness and perceived ease of use from the user's perspective so in designing the user interface we discuss about natural language these are the types so question and answer menus form field and the web-based form, uh, form field we also discuss about designing interfaces for smartphones and tablets and in designing the user feedback the following should be considered okay like for example we need to let the users know if their input is being accepted if input is or is not in the correct form if processing is going on if requests can or cannot be processed and if more detailed information is available and how to get it 
So we also discuss about designing our e-commerce website, especially the feedback. And through the use of feedback, we can create such as feedback such as rollover menus, hierarchical display of the links, sitemaps, and navigation bars. We discuss also the different types of queries, and there are six basic types, which are query one until query five. And there are two major types of query, but the most uh, used nowadays is what we call the SQL or the structured query language. So that's all for this topic. Thank you for your attention.